Okay, so now that we have learned about the frequency response for our RLC circuits, we're going to look at some properties of the frequency response of our RLC circuits. Frequency response uh, of RLC circuits. Okay. Okay, so first some notation, just so that we're all on the same page here. So when I write the frequency response for the conjugate like that, all I'm doing is taking the frequency response and conjugating it. Okay, so nothing too special. You probably, it's probably what you would think anyway. Just wanted to make sure everyone knows uh, what putting this asterisk above the H really means. You just take whatever the frequency response is and conjugate that. Okay, so the first property that we're going to look at is conjugate symmetry. Okay, so what does that mean? This means that when I conjugate the frequency response, what do I get back? Well, it turns out that I actually get H of negative omega. Okay, so if I take my frequency response and conjugate it, how does that change the frequency response? It turns out it actually gives you the exact same function as if you take your frequency response and plug in negative omega. Okay, and by the way, this is just for the frequency response for RLC circuits we're talking about right now. Turns out some of these properties will hold for specific frequency responses we look at later in the class. Um, it involves something I haven't learned about yet, um, but I just wanna make sure that we understand that this is just for the frequency response of RLC circuits that we're talking about right now. Okay, so this is the conjugate symmetry property. So why is this true? Okay, why is this true if H of omega is the frequency response of an RLC circuit? Well, let's just think about what H of omega really is. Well, it's some expression, some expression uh, that contains terms of the form R one over J omega C, or J omega L, right? Because those are the impedances of resistors, capacitors, and inductors, right? Because what do we do we, to find the frequency response? We phasorize the circuit. So all of these circuit components, the R's, the L's, and the C's are gonna get converted into their impedances. And then we're gonna solve that like a resistor network. So what do we do? We take a couple of them, if they're in series, we add them. You know, if they're in parallel, we combine them, you know, as we combine resistors in parallel and so on. So we're gonna get some big expression, but all the terms are gonna be of this form, either R, one over J omega C or J omega L. And we're always gonna be, you know, adding them, multiplying them, dividing them, subtracting them and so on, okay? So let's think about what happens when we conjugate those terms? Each of those terms. We conjugate these terms. We get what? Let's think about it. So what happens if I conjugate the resistor impedance, R? Well, that's real, right? R, C, and L, those are the resistance, capacitance, inductance. Those are just real numbers. They're just parameters. All right, so when I conjugate a real number, I get back the same thing, just R. All right, R is a real number. What happens when I conjugate one over J omega C? Well, we saw in the complex numbers review video that if I have the ratio of two complex numbers, like one and J omega C, I can just, I just get the, when I conjugate them, I just get the ratio of the conjugates. So essentially what I'm telling you is that Z1 over Z2 conjugate where Z1 and Z2 are complex numbers, is just Z1 conjugate over Z2 conjugate, okay? Same with multiplication. It's really the same property. Z1 conjugate, Z2 conjugate, right? Same with addition. Z1 conjugate plus Z2 conjugate, right? And so on. And I encourage you to try uh, proving each of these. It's not hard. Uh, when you're doing division and multiplication, I recommend using polar form. If you're doing addition or subtraction, rectangular form is a little easier. So just for practice, you know, to make sure you can verify that on your own would be, would be good. Okay, anyway, 
So that's true. Well, that's true. So if I have one over J omega C and I conjugate it, I just get one conjugate over J omega C conjugate. We know when you conjugate um, an expression involving J, you just negate all the Js. So we get negative J omega C. Okay, and when I conjugate J omega L, I just get negative J omega L. Okay, so we know our H of omega is just a big sum or product or division or whatever, however we combined all of these terms. Okay, that's all those terms are the only things I see in H of omega. So when I conjugate all of H of omega, I can use all those properties I just erased. You know, you divide, if I added two of these impedances and conjugated it, I would just get the, con, the sum of the conjugates. If I ever multiplied them, I would just get the product of um, the conjugates and so on. Okay, so when I conjugate H of omega, right, what I'm really doing is just looking at every term and conjugating each individual term like this. But wait a second, if we look at these terms on the right, what do we notice? These terms are the same as if we substituted negative omega for omega on the left-hand side, right? If I take all the omegas and substitute negative omega for R, I just get R. If I take all the omegas and one over J omega C and substitute negative omega, I get the same thing, right? One over negative J omega C. If I take all of the omegas here and substitute negative omega, sure enough, I get the same thing. So for these impedances, which are the only terms that appear in H of omega, if I conjugate those terms, it's the exact same as if I just plugged in negative omega for omega. They get me the exact same result. Okay, and so let me just write that. So in summary, since every J in H of omega appears in one of these terms and therefore is paired with an omega, right? An omega variable, right? So every J has an omega with it. Every J has an omega with it, right? Everywhere in H of omega, that's true then conjugating H of omega is the same, really the same exact thing is happening as just negating every omega, right? That's what we just explained. H of omega is just a big sum, product, division, whatever you want of all these impedances. So I conjugate them all. I just get the sum product or division of all the conjugates. All those conjugates look like this, but it's the exact same thing as if we took these original expressions and just plugged in negative omega. We get the exact same thing as when we conjugate because every J is multiplying an omega and all those terms on the left. So whether I conjugate or plug in negative omega, I get the same thing. Because when I conjugate, the J goes to negative J. When I plug in negative omega, I just also add that negative sign. So the same thing's happening. And so, you know, this isn't like necessarily the most rigorous proof, but this is essentially what's going on, that when I conjugate H of omega, I'm really doing the same thing as just plugging negative omega in everywhere I saw omega in my original frequency response H of omega. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that's convinced you. Okay, so now we're gonna use this to get some more properties of the frequency response for RLC circuits. So the first one is what's known as even amplitude. Okay, and this says that the magnitude of H of negative omega equals the magnitude of H of omega. Why is this called even amplitude? Well, it could be called even magnitude, um, but for some reason they use uh, the terminology amplitude in the book. Um, why is this, why is the word even there? Well, it's because even functions are functions that when I plug in negative of the argument, I get back the exact same function I started with, right? Like for instance, you know, cosine is even because if I have any value X here and I plug in negative X, I get the exact same value of the function. All we're saying is that it's symmetric about the vertical axis. That's what even functions are. And so that's what we're saying is true for the magnitude of the frequency response here. When I plug in negative omega, I get back the same thing. So it's symmetric about the vertical axis. Okay, so how do we prove this? Let's start with the left side. 
magnitude of h of negative omega. And now what can we do? What can we substitute in here? Well, look in this line, h of negative omega by property one, this equals the magnitude, I'll just plug in h of negative omega, I'll plug in h conjugate of omega, right? Because these guys are equal by one. Now, what do we get? Well, now I have the magnitude of h conjugate of omega, but we saw in the complex number video that the magnitude of the conjugate of a number is the same as the magnitude of that number. Okay, so the magnitude of z conjugate equals the magnitude of z for any complex number z. So just write that shorthand, this is z, that symbol means is an element of, or is in. So it's the same for any z that's an element of the set of complex numbers. That's the set of all complex numbers. Okay, it's a c with a line. Set of all real numbers looks like that. Okay, so sometimes I'll write that instead of saying for any complex number z, it's just more writing. Okay, so this is something that, again, I encourage you to try and prove on your own, but I'm pretty sure it was in the complex numbers video. And so there you go. If I have h conjugate of omega and I'm just looking at the magnitude, that magnitude is the same as the magnitude of h omega itself. And you can see it visually too. Like if I have any number z in the complex plane, the conjugate is just the number that's mirrored across the real axis. You can see the magnitudes, the distances from the origin should be the same. I'm just mirroring it across the real axis. The distance from the origin shouldn't change. Okay, so that's all this property is saying. Okay, so that's it. So it's just two lines and we get that the magnitude of the frequency response is an even function. All right, how about the next one? This one's called odd phase. Okay, and this says that the angle of the frequency response, what happens when I put negative omega there? Well, now this phase function is gonna be odd. So I get negative the angle of h of omega. Okay, again, that's what odd functions do, like sine, for instance, looks like this. If I take any number x and I look at negative x, then the value of the function gets negated when I go to negative x, right? So sine of negative x is negative sine of x. That's because sine is odd. And that's all we're saying here, that the phase of the frequency response is odd. That's all we're saying. Okay, so how do we prove this? Well, it's very similar. We start with the left side. So we have the angle of h of negative omega. Okay, and we're gonna use again, property one. We're gonna get that this is the angle of h conjugate of omega, because h of negative omega equals h conjugate of omega. And now this is also something we looked at in the um, complex numbers video. Okay, this is just uh, negative the angle of h of omega. And this is true for any complex number. So the angle of z conjugate is just negative the angle of z for any complex number. You can see that just, you know, take uh, z to be r e to the j theta, just some complex number in polar form. Right? When I conjugate it, I get r e to the negative j theta, right? Oops. So what's the angle of my original function z? Well, it's theta. What happens when I conjugate? What's my angle now? Well, clearly it's negative theta, right? So when you conjugate the angle, it goes negative. And again, you can see that visually. If I have any z, and I look at z conjugate. Well, if I had some angle here, when I reflect over the real axis, I'm just gonna go negative that angle. If this is theta, this is just negative theta. All right, so there's many ways to remember this property, hopefully at least one, but hopefully all of them stick. Okay, so you can think about it many different ways. But yeah, when I look at the angle of the conjugate of complex number, I just get negative the angle of the original complex number. Okay, and the last one is that the DC response, and I'll tell you what that means in a second, is real for frequency responses of RLC circuits. And this just says H of zero is a real number. That's all we're saying here. So what's the DC response? Well, the DC response is when there's no AC. So when there's no uh, alternation, when there's no actual frequency, uh, and when does that happen? That happens when omega is zero, right? If I take like cosine of omega t and I plug in omega equals zero, I just get cosine of zero. That's just a number. It's not oscillating anymore. And that's 
sometimes referred to as the DC response, the frequency response when omega is zero. And all we're saying here is that number, whatever it is, okay, whatever the frequency response evaluated at omega equals zero is, it's gotta be a real number. How do we show that? Well, let's look at h of zero, okay? And now again, we're going to use this property one Okay, so what happens if I plug in zero? Well, h of zero, if I conjugate h, I got to negate the argument, right? That's what this is really saying. When I conjugate whatever argument I had, I negate it. Okay. So if I conjugate whatever argument I had, I negate it and then take h of that. That's what conjugate symmetry is. This is again by property one. You can see we're using property one a lot. Okay, and then I'll just write this just to make it nice and clean, but it's pretty obvious. Negative zero is just zero. Okay, so what do we have here? We have that h of zero, whatever that is, equals h of zero conjugated. Well, what numbers equal themselves after conjugation? If a complex number equals itself when conjugated, then that number is real. I'll say is a real number, right? What are all of the numbers in the complex plane that when I flip it across the real axis, I get back the same number? Well, it's gotta be only the numbers that are actually on the real axis, right? Those are the only ones. If I'm not on the real axis, when I flip across the real axis, I'm gonna get a different number. But if I'm on the real axis, when I flip across it, I'm going to get the same number. Okay, so the only numbers that equal themselves when conjugated, which is what we're saying here, are real numbers. And so that tells us that the DC response, the frequency response evaluated when omega equals zero, is a real number. Okay, so those are some properties of frequency response that we might use from time to time. Um, but they're also just sort of interesting and a good you know, practice with some of the topics we've learned so far. So that's it for this video. I'll see you in the next one.